Check, check, check. Yo, what's up? Hey, Diego. Sorry I was a bit late. Um, no worries. I was in backstage, and I was trying to test out my mic, but then yeah. I didn't see it moving, right? And it turns out I was muted the whole time. But <laughs> yeah. No worries. Yeah, that's cool. No worries, man. Welcome. Thank you, bro. Thank How you, you been? so much. Uh, yeah, I've been doing great, actually. Uh, I've been reading a lot and studying a lot. Nice. So, Same here. Yeah. Always. That's cool. Great. Well, awesome. So, yeah. So, thanks for coming to the discussion. Hopefully, we get some people watching it. If not, I'll just – I'll probably post the video later. Um, but, yeah. So, basically, I think it would be a really cool discussion just to talk about – I mean, obviously, the pre-human existence of Christ is a big topic. But – how how it can, how we can prove it um, through learning about the Holy Spirit. I think it's a it's a it's a way from what I've seen, it's a way that's super clear in scripture to prove the pre-human existence of Christ. Um, you know, and I can you know we can go about discussing that, but yeah, um, so I have a couple of things written down that we can go over and I'm still trying to figure this out. Okay. So if I do share screen, um, okay. All right. Can you see this? Yep. Okay. Awesome. So first Peter makes a really great here. case for the pre-human existence of Christ. It's not like a direct it's not a direct, he's not directly saying it, but um, when we read and get in, and understand what he's trying to say, I think it's pretty clear. So like starting, and I'd love to get your thoughts. So like starting in verse 10 here, um, and let me see if I can, I wonder if I can zoom in. Is it? Let's see. It, it's not zooming in. But I can see it. Oh, yeah. Is that better? Zoomed okay. in now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. So starting in verse 10, it says, Concerning the salvation, and I think this is the NIV. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, to you meaning the church, the prophets searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have, that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit from heaven. Um, specifically, verse 11 here. Uh and the NLT actually says it really nice. It says, they wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them, within the prophets, was talking about when he, he told them in advance about Christ's sufferings and his great glory afterward. Um, in some of the translations, they capital capitalize the he, meaning this is, this is the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ was was in them and the spirit of Christ predicted the sufferings of Christ and, and his coming glory. Um, so obviously that's speaking about the Holy spirit, which was within the, in the prophets. And we know this from second Peter, that this is talking about the Holy spirit. Second Peter one 21 we go down to 21 for prophecy never had its origin in the human will but prophets though human spoke from god as they were carried along by the holy spirit so the same spirit that was in the prophets prophesying about christ this spirit of christ right he uh was in the uh prophets so the spirit of Christ, which is the same spirit of the Father, the same Holy Spirit, it's all the same spirit. So it's this spirit of Christ 
was in the prophets way before Christ, right? Way before Christ. And so then the question is, how can, like if the argument is, okay, is the, what is the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit just the spirit of the Father? Is the Holy Spirit, as some Unitarians claim, just an inanimate force? Well, this spirit then can't be the same spirit that's the spirit of the Father. If the spirit of God is the same exact spirit of Christ, this makes Christ God, right? So if it's the same exact spirit, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, um, is within the prophets, that means then that this, that this same spirit, which is speaking through the prophets, is the spirit of Christ, which makes Christ God. <laughs> Do you see yeah. what I'm seeing? Does that make sense? Yeah, I get what you're saying. So like spirit of Christ, equivalent to spirit of God, and the same spirit who's said to be the spirit of Christ inspired the Old Testament prophets. And so this proves that, that when it says the spirit of Christ in them, then Christ was already present in the Old Testament in order for his spirit to speak through them. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Nice. Yep, that's exactly right. And then this also corresponds, you know, because the question, the question that I was, I was discussing with our friend Taylor, and he was claiming, and, and other Unitarians claim that the Holy Spirit is the Father. It's not, um, you know, distinct from the Father. The Holy Spirit is the Father. And to make that claim is pretty absurd. Uh, but like, for, for instance, in Galatians chapter 4, we find in verse 6, right, it's the same Spirit. Or it says, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Right? This is that same spirit. It's all talking about the same thing. This spirit within us, right? The outpouring of the spirit, which also calls forth for, for um, in the first century especially, but the apostles, the guiding them into all truth. So the same spirit, which is the spirit of his son, spirit of the father, um, I mean, of the father's son, that same spirit, which was poured out with to us, allows us to, to, to call out Abba, Father. And that's interesting because if we compare that to Romans, Romans chapter 8, Uh, verse 14, where it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Well, what is the Spirit of God? It's the Spirit of Christ, which allows us to be, the, the, to, which allows us to be the children, right? The sons of God. It's the Spirit that does this. And so the, that's, the, again, it's the same Spirit. It's the Spirit of Christ, which is the Spirit of the Father. It's the same Spirit. Which means then, if it is the same spirit, which uh, eternally proceeds from God, eternally, if it's the same spirit that's of the Father and of Christ, that there is no other explanation than for Christ to be uh, existing in, in the, so at least you have to make the claim that Christ existed in the times of the prophets, because it's the same spirit of Christ. Um, you know, so I, I think that's a pretty good, pretty good claim. That was my first point that I wanted to, to touch on. Good, yeah, it is a good argument. I think I've heard Unitarians say that the spirit of God is somehow different from the spirit of Christ. I think Christian man makes that claim. I don't know. I think he made a video on it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, have to, I may have to check up on that video because I feel like if he really said that, then I guess he's just, uh, yeah. Beyond of beyond, do I, do I be mean? No, no. yeah, he's beyond what I thought he was. Yeah, it's it's, it's a stretch. Point. It's a huge stretch, and it's a basis stretch. I mean, it's a claim that you have to make if you deny the divinity of Christ. You have to make it. If if you accept the New Testament and everything that's said there, you have to deny that the the, the that the Holy Spirit is in any way um, 
related to the spirit of Christ. You can't you can't make that claim because that puts you in the in the uh, mindset of admitting that Christ had a pre-human existence. I'm not sure like what I know, like, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses who do hold to the pre-human existence of Christ. They just make the claim that the Holy Spirit is impersonal, that it's a force, that it's a, you know, an energy it's like Star Wars, you know, <laughs> crazy yeah. stuff. Um, so you have to do that then. So if you do that, then you can maybe make that claim that, oh, well, since Christ didn't, since Christ isn't eternal, then that means the Holy Spirit isn't eternal. But then you have this weird position where the Holy Spirit is created just like the sun was created. And that's the, uh, another thing I wanted to touch on too is what Gregory, St. Gregory of Nyssa talks about. I don't know if you've ever read his, his um, he wrote some apologetics on the Holy Spirit. In on the, the Holy Spirit? Uh, yeah. I think that it was in the, it was in the late fourth century, I think, or maybe mid fourth century. Um, basically, and he, and he, he, he has, he has this, this really long dissertation, but essentially what he's saying is you cannot separate the Holy Spirit from God. Because the moment you do, the moment you say it's a creation, then you have to say there was a time that God existed without his Holy Spirit. You know, it's, and he, he makes the comparison of like water, like wetness to water. Like you can't have water without it being wet. It's a part of what water is. So the Holy Spirit is like the wetness of water or the heat of fire. Like it's, uh, you can have a distinction within, but you can't have it without it. Like, how can you even imagine water that's not wet? It doesn't make any sense. So that's what he, he draws sort of that parallel of what the Holy Spirit is. But anyway, anyway, side, side, side point. Um, yeah, so that was my first point about pre-human existence do you have any uh do you have any points that you wanted to touch on no i was just gonna say um if you uh from galatians 4 you could even see that the spirit is a person because in galatians 4 4 it says that god sent forth his son yeah obvious reference to the sending of the son in the womb of mary right but then when it says he sends forth the spirit of his son and now, all of a sudden, this spirit is not a person, yeah. according to some Unitarians and Jehovah Witnesses. So it's kind of a double standard that they have. Yeah, double standard. Exactly. And that reminds me, too. So in Second Corinthians, that's a good point. In Second Corinthians chapter 3, uh, yeah, yeah, chapter 3. So it says, We'll start in verse 15. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil, a, veil, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. right? And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit, right? Now this should remind us, and I mean, it, it, it could keep going because the context doesn't end there. Like in verse, I mean, sorry, chapter four, this will turn. It says, therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So just before, so Christ is the image of God, right? Christ is the image of God. And yet in uh, chapter 3, where it talks about the Lord is the spirit, or the spirit of the Lord is, there, Lord is, there is freedom. And then in verse 18, 
when we contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image. What is the image? It's Christ, right? Which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. So someone can make the claim, like, like a Unitarian's logic would make the claim, well, the Holy Spirit is this, is uh, is Jesus, right? That's what, <laughs> if you were to read, the, now the Lord is the spirit. I mean, this is talking about Christ transformed into his image, talking about the Lord, the Lord's image, which is Christ, um, comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Someone would read that and think, oh, well, then the Holy Spirit must be Jesus. <laughs> um, and then in the, at the end, I love the ending of, of chapter four, where it says, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So in the face of Christ is displayed the glory of the knowledge, or sorry, the light of the knowledge of God's glory itself displayed in the face of Christ. If that's not a claim to deity, I don't know what is. Um, yeah, most Unitarians are just, um, they're just carnal and they just look for, I guess, where is Jesus called Yahweh or where is Jesus God? Or did, yeah. where did Jesus say, I am God or something like that? Oh, yeah. And sure. so they just pass over the significance of these verses because, yeah. I don't know, they just very carnal people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. And I remember being in that mindset as well of... Um, and it's just, you just miss out so much on so many on so many things, so many truths, spiritual and scriptural truths, um, and it's it's a tragedy because it's like on one on one hand I feel um, like the Unitarians are almost there. It's like <laughs> it's like it's not like the it's not like the Muslims that just twist all these things and just deny the Bible altogether. They accept Christ. They accept Christ as the son of God, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, they're almost there, but it's like, like you said, it's, it's viewing it from a strict lens of carnality, just strictly a carnal lens. And you miss out on so many things and it's unfortunate. It's a, it's sad. It's a tragedy. And it's, it uh, is. it's deception of Satan. <laughs> you know, there's it no is. other way to, so, there's there's the verse right there in front of you. The God of this age has blinded the minds of all. Yeah, there it is. That's right. <laughs> yep. And they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. Yep. And what is that glory? The glory of Christ is the glory of God. And when it, it, it's like I was talking to um who's I talking to about this? It was I think it was on um Clubhouse. Yeah. Where it's like when you when you look at Christ and especially in this passage, but other passages, when you look at Christ, you're looking at the glory of God. That's what the apostles are trying to say. That's what Paul's trying to say. And in this, in Second Corinthians 4 is a good example of this. When you're looking at God, I mean, sorry, when you're looking at Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, you're looking at the glory of God, the glory, the glory of God himself in all its fullness. It's not just, oh, it's a snippet. It's a snippet of God's glory. No, because we find that the full, the fullness of deity dwells in Christ bodily. The fullness. It's not just, oh, it's just a part. You know, it's just a, it's just an emanation, as what the Gnostics would say. Or, oh, it's just, you know, it because Christ is perfect, so therefore it shows us the glory of, of God's creation. It's not, it's not, that's not what the apostles are saying. It's the fullness of God's glory. When you're looking at Christ's face, you're looking at God's face. And I think that's, you know, for for 2,000 years, the, the, there's been such a high regard and high placement for icons of Christ um, and the veneration of icons of Christ. Because it really is that. I mean, it's like, sure, it's not maybe an exact rec representation of, of Christ's glory in the icon. But what you're really looking at and what is trying to be conveyed is you're looking at the face, the human face of the invisible God. Um, you know. Yeah, that's why in 
St. John can say that no one has seen God at any time, but apart from his only begotten Son who has revealed him, right? So that's why he says even in a few verses prior that we see God by, um, I forgot the exact language, but by seeing the glory of his only begotten Son. Yeah. So when we see the glory of his only begotten Son, we are seeing God himself manifested yeah. unto us. Yeah, exactly. And that's a powerful thing. You know, it's a thing that that when it's looked o looked past, it, it just takes a lot of twisting of Scripture to ignore it, or a lot of glory of God. <laughs> um, to, I mean, ignoring the glory of God. Anyway, so yeah, um, that's Corinthians. Obviously, we can go like, I mean, it's too easy to go to John 1.1, 1, 1, but let's just do it. <laughs> Say, we <did. laughs> yeah, Say we did. We might as well. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. And then we get down um, in him was life and, the, and, and that life was the light of all men. And that true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world was coming into the world. So it's not there yet in, in a matter of speaking of um, John's, uh, how do you say, it? John's order of his writing, but it's about to come into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, but the world did not recognize him. So first off, what is the world here? I think sometimes people can get messed up on these little things, but what is the world here? The world is just the world. The world of mankind, you could say. The world of mankind. Um, including the, you know. So he was he was in the world and the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. What does it mean, his own? Right? His own people, his own creation, right? And yet all who did receive him, to those who believed his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. Um, now, so what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. And then the word became flesh. There it is. The word became flesh. So all this stuff. So the, the, the world was made through the word of God. This is the light of the world. The world was made through it. And um, this world that the... The, 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 this world that was made through the word, the world did not recognize him, right? So it can't be speaking of new creation. This isn't talking about new creation. In the new creation, all of creation will recognize um, this power, this light, the light of the world. That's what. It, that's why the light came into the world, to save the world, right? To redeem the world back to God. Um. And uh, there was a point that, what was it? Let me go back to, there's a point in the Discord that I said, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> uh, let me see. That we were talking about. Um, Something about the world not yeah. recognizing him, right? Exactly. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that was up. It was up a little ways. Um Oh, yeah. Just, uh, I'm just going to make a, a comment. So when it says he was in the world, and, through, yeah. and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Literally, everything said about the word here in the prologue of John, including verse 9 and 10, is yeah. said about Christ in the rest of the gospel. Christ literally says that he is in the world. Literally, in quotations, yeah. he's in the world. Literally says, as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That's literally what he says. Exactly. So, and in, in, I think, what website? I think it's biblicalunitarian.com that claims that this passage is talking about the Father. That the Father was somehow in the world. Oh, wow. And it's talking about the Father, which is we're crazy. Gonna, we're going to randomly talk about the Father. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 nuts because if you follow the pronouns, it's talking about the word. Yeah, it's the word who this was whole thing God. is talking about the word. Yeah. 
the one who is coming into the world, as if the Father came into the world. It's, 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 it's the Word who became flesh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I found the point. Yeah, it's, it's just basically that it can't be, because some, some try to, some try to, like, call um, the creation, the, everything was made through him, um, that is talking about new creation, you know. In the beginning, they'll say, in what beginning? <laughs> um, which is silly. As uh, as as if John wasn't know didn't know what he was talking about when he said in the beginning. Like as yeah. if that wasn't a clear reference to Genesis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As word if when he's word. talking about that all things were made through him, that somehow is not the Genesis creation. Yep. Yep. Exactly. But I mean, yeah, and then down here it's obviously can't be referring to new creation. Because salvation was yet to come, right? Because he says, because he 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 says that uh, it, the true light that gives light was coming into the world, was coming into the world. So so far he's he's the light has not been manifest, right? But then it says he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not recognize him. So that's obviously referring to those who rejected him, right? That didn't see that he was the light. God. They didn't see that he was the word of God. They didn't confess that he was the Lord and God. Um, That's literally the gospel narrative. That's why you have the Jews contemplating who is this man, right? Yeah. We know his father and his mother. Who is this man? Or even the yeah. disciples. Who is this man who um, even the winds obey him or the yeah. waters obey him? Right. right. So that's the exactly. whole gospel there i mean these people haven't read the gospel i guess i don't know yeah <laughs> but let's just say like for argument's sake let's say there's some unitarian that say okay that's that's fine but the he is actually a it here <laughs> the e is actually just god's plan so the true light that's just god's plan the true light that gives light to everyone was about to come into the world meaning the plan of god was about to be revealed the plan was in the world and the world was made through it. <laughs> Let's just use their argument. The world did not recognize the plan. Um, the plan came to what was his own. <laughs> it, gets really it gets really tough. The plan came to that which was the plan's own, but the plan did not recognize, or no, sorry, the plan's own did not recognize the plan. <laughs> Dang. Uh, it gets really silly. Um, <laughs> that's because why you have a trillion Unitarian interpretations of John 1 because they yeah. recognize how how destructive to their Unitarianism John 1 is so they just exactly. want to try to figure out any yeah. sort of way to get, get away from the obvious which makes sense then that the only ones who or those who rejected Christ's divinity in the early centuries rejected John like the Ebionites they, they had to reject John you know, they claim that it wasn't, it wasn't inspired of God. And so if they had to reject it, which look like that, that can, that's actually a more legitimate, I think it's a more legitimate um, argument than to try to twist John, to just flat out just say, you know, this, we're not going to accept John. And this is before the established canon. So I can see how they can try to make that claim. They can, that that's a better argument than, 1500 years later saying oh john actually didn't mean what he's saying uh because it's clear like the plan of god came to fruition in christ yet it says he came to his own the, so the plan came to his own well hold on a second because his own the world didn't recognize him so it can't be the plan's own because what does that even mean the plan's own people so the plan <laughs> through the world was made through the plan and the world did not recognize the plan. So give me a break. What does that mean? What makes any sense? And even if, even if you ask them what you mean by that, they, they, they just crumble. Or what does John mean by saying that he was with God? They crumble. Why, how, why does John say that a plan is God? They crumble. They, yeah. they, have, they, they, they have no idea. Yeah. I mean, John 1 is great because it refutes all kind of heresy. It even uh, yeah, refutes exactly. modalism yep. by affirming Christ's deity and personal distinction from the Father. That's right. 
modalism, Gnosticism, Unitarianism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you cool. think about it, I mean, John was probably um, probably knew when he was writing this 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 his gospel mm-hmm. that people will arise later and completely destroy what he, oh, what sure. he meant. Oh, sure. Yep. I agree. That's 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 kind of crazy to think about. Same with Saint Paul. Yeah. But yeah, that's. Well, I agree. I, I'm sure, like, there are some Gnostic ideas, and so you know, I mean, there's clear indication that John, especially in his epistles, addressed Gnostic tendencies. Um, you know, for his saying that those who reject Christ came in the flesh, that that kind of thing. Uh, but when it comes to like, man. <laughs> the heresies that would spring up afterwards those are and there are so many um what saint john in heaven looking down and seeing people (laughs) twist the things that he's saying um my heart goes out to that yeah you know that's true putting like your um putting all this work and effort into preaching the gospel and I mean, not just John, but all the apostles and all the disciples um, under the times of persecution. And then to see how over the next hundred, hundreds of years, how people will twist the words to do all kinds of strange things. It's just, I think that that same spirit of people who do twist and try to tear down tradition and tear down the uh, sort of the norm or the or the the church's understanding of things. It's the same spirit, man. It's the same sort of vindictive, argumentative uh, spirit that you find in um, a lot of Unitarians. Not all, but a lot, because it comes from that same spirit of rebellion, of just thinking, oh, I'll be the one. I'll be the one to figure out what this is saying. I'll be the final judge, you know. It's you know. just like Satan. I mean, Satan, Satan, and even the demons know what Scripture mean. Yeah. I, um, and they know Scripture; they memorize it as well. I don't know if you. So Saint Athanasius wrote a uh, biography on Saint Anthony the Great, and he documents about how these t- demons would just mm. recite Scripture. Oh, sure. Trying to trying Crazy. to tempt uh, Saint Anthony, right? Wow. And it's also crazy how even in the temptation of Jesus, Satan uses verses from the Old Testament to try to prove his case. Oh, that's exactly right. That's a good so point. So it's the same spirit that, you know, has pe- uh, entered into the Gnostics, yeah. the Arians, the Mohammedans, and now the Sicilians. Yep. And I think it's it's a foolish thing to think that, oh, Satan and the demons don't know what the scriptures say. I would argue they know exactly what they say. And you see, like, when Satan was tempting Christ in the desert, um, the way that he used the scripture, which was out of context and uh, (laughs) using it, because, like, it's like this. It's like he knew that the scriptures have authority. We all, even like if you were to debate a Unitarian, we're in the mutual understanding that the scriptures have authority. Right, that we both mutually understand and agree that there's weight behind the scriptures, so we can agree on that. And when Satan does the same thing, he's like, "I know that you think and that you have uh, that these words are from you, that these words are inspired, and that they're everlasting. Watch how I'm going to use them then to twist it on you. It's so." evil it's like so vindictive but you again like you see that same thing happening and like a lot of times it's not to the people's fault right it's not to the individual's fault that they get deceived um you know you could you ultimately blame sinful tendencies of man and the influence of spirits of the air but anyway anyway let's get back to the (laughs) topic (laughs) <laughs> All right, so the next verse that I wanted to highlight, so it's it's found um, 
uh, let's see. Well, yeah, it's more so for a deity of Christ, but I did want to talk about it. So he who descended. Here we go. Ephesians 4.10. Uh, yeah, so Paul is speaking, and he says, There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So here we're saying Christ giving us grace. That's interesting. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took on he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Then Paul explains, what, is he, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens. Not just some of the heavens, all of the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. And I think like that is one of those verses that um, if you just think about for a second. Okay, so he he ascended higher than all the heavens. Now there's a verse which relates to it. I'm, I'm not sure if it's in the side here, in the Old Testament, where it talks about that no, not even the heavens can contain him. What is that? That's First Kings 8, 27. Kings 8. 27. Here we go. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven. Whoa, that's interesting because that's really similar. Highest heaven cannot contain you. Cannot contain you. And what did, what did Paul just say in Ephesians? That he ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe now when obviously when the when paul was writing this um in the first century he's not just talking about space and the planets and the stars and stuff which i'm sure he would include it but the idea of the heavens the invisible realm the realm that's above our physical universe that's not bound by our physical you know carnal sort of realm, uh, Christ has ascended higher than that. So higher than any created place. That's really what that's saying. Any created place, which is all the heavens, right? Everything, every creation, Christ has ascended higher than that. Higher than everything that's created. Invisible, invisible. So that he might fill the entire universe. And I think that Greek word, what is that Greek word? Let me see. For universe, it's like a, it's encompassing all things. Like, so it's not just physical, not just the physical universe, but where is it? Uh, all things. So that he might fill all things where the world. Yeah, all things. Where in the world? Oh, yeah, it's at the bottom. That's right. All things, panta, all whole, every kind, including all forms of declension, apparently a primary word, all, any, every, all. All things, everything, which includes everything created, right? So <laughs> if that, again, is not a call for deity, I don't know what is. That's crazy because how can you still affirm that Christ is a mere man? Yeah with just a body and soul and then say that when he ascended on high he fills all things yep. That's, that, you know i think i haven't heard a response to that i haven't even heard the unitarian cope to this but yeah I, I don't think i've ever i asked it in a comment i think once um i don't remember to who i said it but there was no response i don't really know what they would say because i know they affirm or at least some unitarian other unitarians don't affirm that christ is still human Christ is still flesh. Um, but if you hold that Christ is still flesh and not God, not deity, how can a f how can flesh fill the universe? Does it make any sense? 
And the same thing is said about the spirit and wisdom. I don't yeah. know if you could pull it up in Bible Hub. Uh, Psalm? Wisdom of Solomon. Oh. 12, verse 1. Oh, the wisdom of Solomon? I think yep. that is. Let me see. That's in the Deuterocanon? Yep. I think I can. Let me see here. Ah, come on. I'm pretty sure if I go here. Yeah. You said wisdom. Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom yeah, here we go. Solomon. 12 verse 1. Ah, it won't let me. All right, I'll just have to skip ahead. Let's see. So verse 12 or chapter 12. They need to get their Deuterocanon. I have to memorize more verses. All right. Wisdom of Solomon 12, and then you said 11? No, 1. Verse 1. Oh, 1. For thine incorruptible spirit is in all things. Yeah. It's a good memory, man. Good job. Yeah, I'll start remembering because <laughs> I know the fathers quote it, quote wisdom a lot. Like a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's oh, very yeah. central to, especially anti Aryan, in order to refute the Aryans. Wisdom, is, wisdom of Solomon was used a lot. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Good verse. You also brought up um, in the chat uh, Psalm 68. Oh, yes. Paul quotes Psalm 68. Yeah. Verse 18. Psalm. Sixty-eight. Verse 18. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> when you ascended on high, you took many captives. You received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, that you, the Lord God, <laughs> might dwell there. Then Praise check be out the Lord. next verse. Praise, Praise be to, to the Lord, Lord to, God, to our God, God our Savior. Yeah. Wow, man. Who bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. When the sovereign Lord comes, escape from death. Surely God will crush the heads of his enemies. That sounds like Genesis 3, 15. That also sounds like Psalm 110. It does, yep. The hairy crowns of those who go on in their sins. The Lord says, I will bring them from Bashan. I will bring them from the depths of the sea. Wow. I never looked at it like that. When you ascended on high, you took many captives. You received gifts from the people, from the rebellious, that you, Lord God, might dwell there. What's this I? Or they. That they... That they, Lord God, might dwell there. Still, yeah, but they're still speaking of, still sp speaking to God. So when you ascended on high, yes, this is speaking talking to about God. Talking about talking. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Um, cool. Cool. What else? What else do we have? So uh, I think John 3. Is it John 3.31? I don't know if it says that Christ is in all or Christ is over all. I don't oh, know. yeah. John, you said John 3? Three? 3.31. 3, 31. Yeah, John 3. The one who comes from above is above all. That's oh, the yes. NIV, though. Let me see. I think it is above all. He has come from above and is greater than anything else. Above all, above all, above all. Yeah. Yes, he's above. He was of who is he who is of the earth, is earthly. He who comes from heaven is above all. That's pretty clear. <laughs> yes, especially the one who's who from, from heaven. heaven. Yeah. Pre-human existence. Yeah. And also, you have even in verse thirteen, speaking about the one who descended from heaven. Yeah, exactly. In verse 13, 
No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, son of man. That's pretty clear, too. I know, like, sometimes what they'll jump to, it's a pretty lame argument. They'll so, say, all good things come from heaven, or all oh good things come from heaven. <laughs> so that's not talking about him, literally. <laughs> it's not talking about the persons. It's talking about gifts. All things yeah. come from heaven. But when yeah. you say that, for example, I've come from heaven, that's a person speaking, especially in the words of Jesus. That's a person speaking. They wouldn't yeah. deny that. Yep. And it says no one, no one has ever gone into heaven. Let me see what the Greek says anything. Audes, no one, nothing, none has ascended <clears throat> to go up, to ascend. <clears throat> and that reminds me of... Um, yeah, just the passage that we were just looking at in Ephesians, going up, ascending to heaven. He who ascended is the one who descended. And he who descended is the one who ascended into the higher, above all things, above all the heavens, so that he may be in all things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty cool. And it's not some sort of exaltation that Christ did not have beforehand or before the incarnation, because even Christ's own words says that of his exaltation to glorify him in the glory that he had before the world was. So yep. whatever glory that he has received, quote unquote, um, it's the same glory that he already had with the father before yep. the world was. Yep. Before the world was. Yeah. Yeah. And unless you take just a, a, a completely left field, allegorical and i don't even understand like what is he allegorically saying then if it's all just symbol symbology um it's really reading into the text to say i came from heaven not to do my will but to do your will it's really reading into it to say oh he's just meaning um you know <laughs> whatever that's they why, there, say. that's why satan hates the church i mean because yeah. satan Sorry, Satan loves to bring up new interpretation. I mean, even if they say John is highly allegorical, yeah, I don't know how you could still remain sola scriptura. You know, oh sure, you sure. know, God just decided to give us this gospel that apparently no one knows how to read. Yeah, and it's apparently a guide to us. Yep, but then everyone has their own understanding of it. Yeah, so you know, just maybe think about that a little bit. For yep. the Unitarians out there. And I think it's like, uh, it, it, it gives you, it's like, it gives you the sense of, you know, if, if you think that you're, that you can open up the Bible and start interpreting it for yourself and figure things out that for some reason have been hidden all this time, 2000 years have been hidden. Um, I do see how it like gives you a sense of pride. It gives you a sense of pride thinking, oh, I've discovered something. I've discovered something that was hidden. And it's the same Gnostic idea, this idea of secret knowledge, that it's this knowledge that um, that makes me feel special, you know, that makes me feel like uh, like I'm learning some hidden truth when that's absolutely against what the scripture says. It says we're to be the light of the world. So if you're going to look for the truth, the truth is going to be there. It's going to be a shining light for all to see. It's not going to be hidden underneath the basket or what Christ said. It's going to be there for all to see, for all to have, to all to grasp. Uh, and there wouldn't be a time where, where there would be this great apostasy where this truth would be lost. Or, you know, anyway, hold on a second. Sorry about that. You there? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, anyways, you're right. Yeah. Same. Same thing that's been going on all this time. 
And I think even before Christ, you'd find the same the same sort of idea where you had, like, even in Christ's time, there were multiple sects of interpretation, those who interpreted the Old Testament, you know. I think there were three main ones. There was the Pharisees, there was the Sadducees, and there were there was one more. I forget what they're called. Uh, and then before that, like the like, remember the story of Moses and Korah. Korah was like, "Who put you in charge?" Here we are wandering around in the desert. Um. You know, why should we listen to you? I should be the one that will lead us into the promised land. It's the same spirit, man. Since day one. It's the same spirit. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, my mic decided to shut down for some reason. But um, it's back up. So, yeah, it's the same spirit that inspired Muhammad. Same spirit that inspired every false prophet. to, yeah. For some reason, they thought that they were receiving the final truth or that, hey, I mean, forget all that history. Yeah. I was I, I was spoken by God himself. He revealed to me this and that. That's why you have many Unitarians saying, hey, with the Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit, you know, I can't possibly be wrong. Yeah. You know, it's that, it's, I hate to say that, it's just arrogance. It's the yeah. same arrogance that has Satan. Uh, it's the same arrogance that fills Satan every day. Yeah. When he decides to rebel against 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 God. And even I don't know, you know, like um in exorcism tapes, I don't know, I, I somebody shared a transcript of one of the most famous trans uh, mm -hmm. uh exorcism cases. Yeah. And the priest basically asks the demon, right, you know, the fallen angels, yeah, if he would do it again, rebel against God again. Yeah. And the demons obviously say yes. Wow. Yes, I will do it again and again and again, right? So it's wow. the same arrogance that fills the demons that inspires yep. every false prophet in history. That's crazy. And the thing, too, it's like they've had eons to um, practice, so to speak. I, I was thinking about that the other day. It's like, you know, we live on this world. You know, I've lived 29 years or something, and I feel, I feel like I've... I, there are some things that I know pretty well, I guess. I don't know. I know there's a lot of things I don't know. Um, I'm still learning. But the thing with the demons, the angels, they've been around for who knows. Who knows when God dis actually dis decided to start creating. If you can call it that. Like dis like when. Like furthest back in time. Um, and when exactly they fell, the demons fell. Well, obviously it was... Uh, you know, there's the idea that it was bef right before the garden. Um, but like, so if, if the demons, the same demons have been deceiving men since the start of men, start of mankind, that a same demon who like, let's say, twisted or uh, uh, deceived like Cain, is, it, is there the same demon, demon exists today, this very day? And so you, you don't think like they know exactly what they're doing. You don't think like they know the best way, you know, the most deceptive way, how to deceive people. Um, That's interesting because I think this, uh, the exorcism I was mentioning, I forgot her name, but I think it's like Annalise or something. Um she she had basically i think six or five demons and one of the demons said that uh he dwelt in cain that are you serious wow. yeah the same demon who dwelt in cain judas nero dude that's nuts that's the other that's nuts yeah <laughs> that's intense man wow and that so that that just goes to show you like I, they'll do it again and again it's it's almost like i wouldn't say this because because studying augustine saint augustine it helped me a lot with with the with his with with the theory of privation, the privation idea of why is there evil, you know. Um, and basically, I'm not sure how much you've looked into that, but uh, there there is no actually there's no s such thing as a substance of evil. Evil is simply the, the that which is lacking the good, 
It's not, it's you not living up to what you were designed to live up to, you know? Yes. Um, nothing. Yes. Yes. True. Yeah. It's just simply the lacking of the good. So then, but then that, that makes you think, okay, so a being like an angel, which was created fully good, just like Adam was created fully good. Um, the idea that he's that an angel would still make the decision to fall and become evil, right? Um, you still can't say that they're wholly evil by their substance, because there's no such thing as a substance of evil. But there, there is just so far removed from the good that now all that is left is like this just purely rebellious, uh, um, you know, twisted being um that's powerful you know and it's uh dangerous <laughs> and i really think like I, I have this idea and i've been mulling it over um you know the saints talk about it the fathers talk about it um i know paul hints at it and the old testament hints at it but there's this idea that there's the principalities right the principalities that are in the air and whether for good or for bad um have do have control over um the way that things are sort of moving you know like a city you can say like like, like for example in the old testament where it talks about the prince of persia right who fought with the prince of uh was it israel but it was saint michael you know michael the archangel the prince of persia and then the prince of jerusalem i think is what Michael was referred to, or the prince of your, your people, I think is what he refers to it as. Um, one of the angels, who I think is speaking to, who is he speaking to? Anyways, anyways, the story is basically, so cities, if you can view a city as um, a living thing, you know, something that has a destiny, something that's moving, something that's breathing, something that uh, uh, consumes things and exports things. It, a city, in a sense, is a being. It's a living thing, so to, so to speak. It has a destiny. It's mortal. It's doomed to die at some point. And how a demon can be over or a principle or a ruler of a city. And what is a city but just a group of people, a large group of people? And how sort of um, the demons or the angels are... are waging war so to speak in the air and over like i heard this one this phrase one time it's like the angel and the demons fight and the battleground is the hearts of men yeah and it's like uh i i truly think that let it like it's like whenever we get tempted let's say or a temptation or a question comes into our head and it's like where did that come from I don't think it's too far removed to say it's either from an angel or a demon. Um, I think there's very true. There's very there's very true. or like an I don't and I don't and I don't want to uh, pull away from man's responsibility. We're all responsible for the things we do. We'll all be judged accordingly, you know, in love in the grace of God. But there's still this question that we ask, okay, how far? Because like, if you look at the, 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 the case of Judas, Judas the Iscariot, great example. In the room during the uh, Last Supper and the institution of the Eucharist and all this stuff, it says that Satan entered into him, right? The demons entered into him. And, to made, and, and, and then when Christ was speaking to Judas, he wasn't just speaking to Judas. Because remember, he said, go do what you have to do or, you know. And so there was more going on. So then you can ask, well, is Judas responsible then? Of course he's responsible. But that doesn't mean he's not influenced. He was not influenced and demons dwelling within to carry out the, the rebellion, the rebellious and the twisting of the truth. That's all the rebellion is, the, the, re the rebellious ideas and acts of the demons is simply rebelling against the truth twisting the truth you know and so like i'm sure the demons understand that they're not going to just come out and just say these 
these random fairy tale stuff that no one's gonna no one's gonna take seriously they're gonna say things that it makes sense they're gonna say things that if you put pu certain puzzle pieces together they're like oh yeah that i can see how that can be true they're not gonna say something that's like oh you know unicorns in the there's unicorns in the forest that you need to start believing in um no they're going to like exactly what you said how Satan used the scriptures to try to deceive. They're going to do the same exact thing. And they've been doing the same exact thing, right? Right from the garden. Right from the garden, Satan said, didn't God say, didn't God say that, um, you know, or he said, isn't it so, you know? So it's like, it's the same exact thing. It's, and it's always been the same thing, you know, uh, you just got to be careful out there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Submit to the church. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's why Satan hates the church. He hates unity. And yeah. what he loves is division. Yeah. And also, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'd have to, like, polish this argument, make it nice. But um, a lot of, you know, Unitarians recognize there's a lot of evil in this world. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of demonic forces in this world. But then how can you say that God didn't preserve the true identity of his own self right. while there are evil in this world like while yep. there's evil in this world we're supposed to trust in the true god yep. in order to persevere right but then unitarians say that god basically failed i mean god waited until this italian guy <laughs> his commentary on john one right, putting a new right. perspective on, on 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 the interpretation of scripture Right. Yep. So it's like, how do you even trust God at that point? Being a Unitarian, of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And like it says, so the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So this truth, this light, this light of the world manifests in Christ, Christ, who is this light, the truth, who is the way and the truth and the life, Christ Jesus, shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness, the evil, the confusion the twisting you know ev everything you know all those synonyms whatever synonym you, know, you want to use darkness the evil the the lies you can say has not overcome the truth right and that also reminds me of when christ uh guide guide you in all truth what is that he will guide you in all truth yeah the paraclete when the spirit of truth comes, there it is, John 16, 13. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now, what's interesting here, <clears throat> and I'm sure you've gone over this too, Diego, but um, in verse 12, Christ is speaking to his apostles. <clears throat> he says, I have much, and this is at the very end, right? Because all that's left to happen is basically he gets, I think he gets arrested in the next chapter. He prays. Yeah, he has the prayer for his disciples and while his disciples 18. are sleeping. <clears throat> but yeah, then 18, he gets arrested. So this is basically like his last speech to his apostles. And this is really interesting what, he's, what he says. He says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. More than you can bear at this moment. But then he's like assuring them, but don't worry, because when he, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. So it's almost like saying, okay, we, we, it's like Christ is saying, I'm, I have to leave you, right? I have to do what needs to be done, but you do not worry because you will have the spirit of truth, which will always be with you and will guide you into all the truth, right? And then that also reminds me of all these scriptures are coming out. Um, bulwark, what is it? The church is the bulwark and foundation. Yeah. Is it the pillar of all truth? Yeah. Or it's pillar? Is it is, pillar? Which one is that? I think church the, is the pillar. I think yeah. it's Timothy. Yeah, 1 Timothy 3. Yeah, there we go. 1 Timothy 3.15. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's church. 
right? That word is church, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth, right? So in that it, it's perfect with what Christ said um, before he was arrested. He was saying that there's you're not ready for a lot of the things that there's more that I have to say, but you're just not ready for them right now, which I personally believe includes the articulation of the Trinity. But and in and, and every all of the councils, like you can say all throughout history up to all our day to day, there are things that at whatever particular time we're just not ready for no re for, you know, just for just for the reason, like nothing against it has come. Right. Like it, it wouldn't make sense for the apostles in the first century just to, to, to say all the things that was in the Council of Nicaea because the heresy of um, the heresy of uh, Arius, Arianism. the air, yeah, the Arian heresy had not come yet. So there's, there, there, it would just be, it would make, it would make zero sense in that context. But your Christ says you're, so you're, there's more things that I need to tell you, but you cannot bear them right now. But when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will always be with you. And the truth will always be with you. And in 1 Timothy 3.15, what is this? What is this truth? Well, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. That means that the truth is only found in the church. If you go outside the church, you go outside the truth. You go outside. You don't have the pillar anymore. You don't have this safeguarding, this thing that's safeguarding the truth for eternity. And if the church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of the truth, then it cannot err ever. Yep, right? Exactly. Christ would then be a liar and would yep. basically say, well, uh, forget what I said about the, the spirit guiding you into all the truth. You erred on the Trinity, for example, or Unitarian. Right. Right? So right. you can't possibly reconcile scripture with, with uh, Unitarianism or, yeah. or rejecting the church or any sort of authority. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Well, good stuff, man. I uh, probably probably get going. I have to get some dinner. Oh, that's it's all good. good. I'm kind of hungry too. So <laughs> after this, I'm gonna go yeah. get some food. But hey, man. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Right. And thanks so much for for yeah, coming no on. Problem. I'll send you a. I'll send you a one-hour lecture from this priest um, talking about spiritual warfare. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Cool. All right, man. All right, man. Well, God bless and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, man. God bless. Have a good day.